Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Travel Season 3. In case you forgot, over the summer break, my name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of joining you all as we kick off Season 3 in style by barging down canals in Burgundy and hiking high in the Swiss Alps with none other than Rick Steves himself. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to our tour guide this evening, the one, the only, Rick Steves. Gabe, thank you so much. And it's great to be back on Monday Night Travel. We had a nice little break, and now we're kicking off season three. And I'm thrilled to be your host this evening as I share with you what I did on my summer vacation. You know, I told my friends I'm taking a vacation and they really couldn't believe it because when I go to Europe, I just have to keep working on the guidebooks and the tours and the TV shows and so on. But I really wanted to take a vacation. I needed a vacation and so did my girlfriend, my favorite travel partner, Shelly. And we were debating, what should we do? We wanted to hike because we enjoyed hiking around Mount Blanc last year and we wanted to do another extended hike. But we also wanted to go um, on the barge trip through the canals of Burgundy and have all that beautiful French food. Barge food, gourmet trip in France and Burgundy, or hiking in the Swiss Alps. Hiking, barge, gourmet, you know, beautiful mountains. And we thought we can do it both. We can do both of these. So we, we dedicated two weeks to an amazing experience. And I'm here to tell you the story. We've got lots of details on how you can do it on your own. And we're just celebrating the joys of travel. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm gonna, it's kind of a tale of two vacations this evening. Uh, the first half is gonna be barging through the canals of Burgundy in France. And then we'll take a four hour train ride and we'll go to my favorite part of the Swiss Alps, the Berner Oberland. Um, you know, this whole barge thing started because 10 or 15 years ago with my TV crew, we were in Burgundy and we hopped on a barge called the Papillon. And we pretended we were on vacation on the barge and we had a great time filming. And I had so much fun on that barge day. I thought, I want to come back here and not fake like I'm on vacation, but really be on vacation. And for 10 years, I've been dreaming about taking this barge tour on the canals of Burgundy. Finally, we have a chance to do it. I want to show you the two and a half minute clip from the original TV show. And then I'm going to take you on the trip that I just got back from. I'm just getting over jet lag. So thanks again for joining us. And I'm going to just, uh, let's see, I'm going to take you to our homepage at ricksteves.com because it's back to school time and I want to celebrate teachers. I love teachers. I've got so much respect for teachers. They are our future. They are in the trenches helping our next generation make this nation of ours get on track and be stronger and smarter than ever. And I like to help teachers expose their students to the world through our TV shows. So we have a program, which is our gift to teachers. If you go to ricksteves.com, like I am right now, and you look down here on the different tabs, you'll find me holding out an apple, symbolically offering a gift to all the teachers in the United States. And if you click on that program, it's called Classroom Europe. And what we have here, it's a complicated, I mean, there's lots you can do here, but basically you got five or 600 clips, three, four, five minutes each, and you can type in whatever you want. I'm on the search bar here, and I'm just going to type in canal. And here's every little clip that has something to do with a canal. And the first one says, the canals of France's Burgundy. Wow. And it's two minutes and 26 seconds. Let me take you to Burgundy on the original clip. And then we're going to go on this very boat for our own vacation. Here Burgundy, we go. Burgundy, like much of France, is laced by canals dug in the early industrial age. 200 years ago, canals like these provided the cheapest way to transport cargo. With the help of locks, you could actually ship your goods clear across France from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. Today, trains and trucks do the heavy hauling, and canals are for relaxing, an art form in which the French excel. Whether you're cruising in a big full-service luxury barge or a small captain-it-yourself boat, the basic experience is the same. A lazy glide by pastoral scenes. Yeah, I think they turn away. Do you think so? This time I'm joined by my friend and co-author of my France guidebook, my favorite Francophile, Steve Smith. <laughs> I love slowing down. Cruising is the best way to see Burgundy. It forces you to slow down. And Steve's family is hitching a ride, too, as we learn how the French, who invented our modern concept of a vacation, are on to something good with barging. Oh, my. 
The canal side lane, built as an industrial age towpath, is ideal for jogging, strolling, or biking. Boats come with bikes, and the pace is relaxing enough to allow for excursions. Your ride is punctuated by a lock every mile or so. By going from lock to lock, boats can gently climb step by step over the rolling terrain. Each lock is a treat. Attendants who live in the historic lock houses are friendly and always ready to help out. Some locks are automated. Others involve a little old-fashioned elbow grease. Full-service barges can be hired with a captain and crew who do the navigating, cooking, and guiding. Boats have comfy staterooms. All the comforts you'd expect in a good hotel, and you'll invariably be eating and drinking some of the very best that Burgundy has to offer. Ah, here's my wine glass. Our day on the canal was an ideal family vacation. Three generations, the scenery coming to us, a capable skipper, and not a care in the world. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Can you see how I would be intrigued by that to actually go for a week on a ship like that? My goodness. Well, that's what we're going to do right now. Before we do, I want to introduce you to my wine and my little nibble board, because when we're in Burgundy, we want to eat and drink well. I got some um, uh, wine from, it's Beaujolais, and this is from Burgundy. It's a region Beaujolais in Burgundy, and Beaujolais is a light-bodied, sort of a fruity wine with a high acidity. It's one of the most um, uh, massively produced wines in France. People just love this wine. It's a Gamay grape, and it's made near Lyon near Bone, where we like to go on our tours. And it's a great light wine if you're just having a good time. And I've got my cheese board here. And when we're on the, the cruise on the Burgundy Canal, every day before dinner, we'd have a little cheese board. And I've got on here, I've got um, some uh, Roquefort, which would be what we'd call blue cheese or gorgonzola. I've got some Latour, which is actually uh, three different milks together, sheep, goat, and cow. And I've got some Swiss cheese, Emmental, because the last half of our show this evening is in Switzerland. And I've also got a mousse de foie de canard au porto. That is a pate with uh, the liver of duck with uh, some eggs and cream and spices mixed in, infused by port wine. So I'm going to be nibbling on that. I hope you've got your favorite travel partner with you and some nice wine or something to drink and something to nibble on. And right now, I'm going to take you on vacation with me. Um, now, this is just from a trip I made just, uh, I left home about a month ago. And uh, I've got a tradition now when I go on a trip, I get a photograph of me with my light bag on the deck saying goodbye to my normal world. There you see the bag I live out of, 9 by 22 by 14 inches, carrying on the airplane-sized suitcase. Especially these days, you don't want to check any luggage if you can avoid it because of the congestion in airports around Europe as they try to staff up. Uh, if you're not checking any bags, you're in much better shape. And instead of my normal day bag, I took my fancy Osprey bag there because I was going to do some serious hiking and every day for seven days in a row. That was going to be with me as I explored the Alps. Okay. I love a direct flight to Europe, and we flew from Seattle straight to Paris. We were on a fancy barge tour, and that meant at the airport, we were met by a minibus that took us all the way to Burgundy, and our captain was waiting for us at the Papillon. This was our home for a week. This is a 1902. It's a 120-year-old cargo boat that was renovated and turned into a luxury um vacation boat, but originally it did on the canal what boats did on the canal, why the canals were built back in the 1800s to take goods from the factories, from the fields, from the silos into the market. And uh, it's a hundred foot long boat. Uh, the Papillon uh, is uh, specializing in beautiful cruises on canals and on rivers in Burgundy. This is the flag of Burgundy that flew from the bow of our boat. We had a crew of four 
the captain, Lee, uh, the chef, Luke, and two mates. And they took great care of us. And we had a, a, uh, a, a, a what do you call it, a passenger list of four. So we had four people serving four vacationers, and it was first class, I got to say. Uh, me and Shelly and our good friends, Bob and Jenny, and we had the boat to ourselves. Now, when you think about the inland waters uh, in Europe, in France in particular, you've got rivers and you've got canals that connect the rivers. And uh, you're not really going anywhere. You're just on the canals. So, you know, we started on the Seal River in Luhan, and then we went up uh, back onto the uh, Stone River. And then we got off on the Canal du Centre. But it doesn't really matter where we went. The captain took care of that. I was on vacation. When you're thinking about going on the waterways of inland France or anywhere in Europe, you got options. I mean, the big boat is the, you know, like the Viking River cruises that we hear so much about. That's several hundred people on a giant boat like that. Well, that cannot go on the canals. That's going to be a river boat. And there's plenty to do on the rivers in France. But I wanted to go on the canals. If you're going to be on the canals as well as the rivers, there is a bigger version of the canal boat that will probably accommodate a dozen people with a crew of four or five or six. And uh, that would be a lot less expensive than a boat like we had, which just had four passengers. Uh, or the budget way to go on the canals is to rent your own do-it-yourself boat. And uh, the most popular company, I think, is called La Boat. But to put things into perspective, our trip was a luxury trip. There was four of us. We hired the barge for ourselves. It cost about $1,000 a day per person for the boat, for the crew, for a minibus that give us took us around side tripping, all the sightseeing and all the food. So that was the top end. If you wanted to go on the big river cru cruise ship, that'd be about $300 a day per person, including meals. And if you wanted to go on this rental boat, it cost about $100 a day if there's four people traveling together to share the cost and you do your own food. So you can do it affordably or you can do it in a more luxurious gourmet kind of way. It depends on your interests and your budget. On the first day, we met our Captain Lee and had our champagne and we learned about how the boat works, what the plan was, where we were going to go. And um, it was just a good introduction. Uh, of course, uh, Luke was downstairs in the galley working on our first dinner, and he was busy all the time making sure we were well fed. We happened to be starting in a town called Luan, which has one of the most beloved markets anywhere in France. And this is really important for our gourmet plan because we need to buy food in the region that is seasonal and according to our taste. This is just a quick chance to meet the captain and check out this cool market. Check out this video clip. Hey, I'm Rick Steves. We're just loading up onto our barge and I want you to meet our captain. His name is Lee. Hey, Lee. What's Good the name morning. of this town? This is Luon. It's the furthest eastern point of Burgundy before you hit the Jura. And uh, what body of water are we on? We're on the Sey. S-E-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Yeah, and you could, you could go on these canals all the way across France from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. And uh, all the way to Moscow, if you... Uh... I don't want to go to Moscow, but we're going to, but we're going to go around France. <laughs> yeah, but all the way to Bordeaux as well, yeah. Before we sail, we have to go to the market we do. and get provisions. The biggest market in France. All right, and the so best. here we go. No here we Thank you, Lee. We're looking forward to the cruise. It's just an amazing scene. In fact, the longest line is right here. And this is for Chevaline, Chevaline which if I, under, if I understand correctly, that means horse meat. But we walked around this town last night, it was dead. And right now it is thriving. The whole place is taken over. Oh yeah. You know the cool thing about this cruise is it's very workaday France and uh, no famous towns, but it's just a great opportunity to be in France. Happy travels. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh my goodness. To be in those markets, I just gotta, I just gotta stop sharing here and just say it's nice to be with you. This is so fun to have had this trip and to be able to come home and share it with all of my friends on Monday Night Travel. Here's to you and here's to your travel dreams. I think 2023 is going to be a great year for traveling. And I hope you can pick up some ideas as we dream together right now. So we're in that market. And, uh, you know, we want local food. We want seasonal food. We want to make sure Luke has what he needs to cook to our finest dreams. Beautiful, tasty, fresh produce. Mm. And I had some thoughts about bucket lists while I was in this market. I want to share it with you here with this clip. You know, I'm Rick Steves. I'm in some little town in Burgundy in France. I think it's called Luan. And I've got a real problem with bucket list travel. You know, people have a bucket list of famous things. I've never heard of this town, Luan. It's not on my bucket list, but this is real France. And the point is, you can just experience real France. I mean, this is just your no-name little family pub. And it's market day. Everybody's here with their dogs and having a glass of wine in the morning. And the gang here sharing a nice, beautiful bottle of local white. But uh, the rain cleared up. We're in the shadow of the church. And uh, it's market day. And uh, this is the time when everybody gets out. It's the great equalizer. Everybody stands in line. Everybody tastes it the same. But if you want to embrace life in your travels in a way that's just really honest, really honest, you can put yourself in a town where there's not another tourist. It's not rocket science. You don't need a guidebook. You've just got to know how to travel. you just got to know how to travel. And today, I'm traveling in France and I don't have a bucket list. Happy travels, happy connecting, happy experiences. Happy melons. Happy melons. Okay, so we've got the we've got the ship stocked. We've enjoyed our first little town there in France in Burgundy. And when we get on our boat Every time we have a meal, the staff explains to us what we're eating. I love that because you learn what are the connections with the culture? What are the stories behind the food and the wine? And each meal was a work of art. It was just a beautiful experience. If you like French food, it's really, really, really nice to have a have your own chef who knows what your taste is and he puts together what you are dreaming about. It's funny because I, I mentioned just in passing that I love cheese. I said I could have a cheese board for every meal and I wouldn't get old. And the chef heard me say that and I had a cheese board for every meal for the rest of the time. And it didn't get old. I wouldn't want a second week of it, but I think I had more cheese in one week than I have in a whole year. But it was great. The French and their cheese. Oh my goodness. There's, I, I believe they have a, a, a different cheese for every day of the year if they wanted it. And we had different cheese every day on our trip and it was gorgeous. Just beautiful. Took us about half a day to get into the groove. And we <laughs> we were so relaxed and it was so graceful, just gliding tranquilo through the countryside on these canals. And uh, it was just a delightful experience. Every, every few hours, you'd come to a lock and you'd jump out and you'd crank the handle and the gate would open up and the boat would come in and you would then lower or raise the water and you would sail on. And that's kind of how it worked. Remember, the canals were dug originally as industrial canals. In fact, our boat was originally an industrial cargo boat. And uh, this is an old uh, silo or some part of the local economy. And uh, it just harkens back to a time when there really wasn't tourism. And uh, the rusted hull of this cargo boat is there reminding us that these waterways were how you got your goods to the market. If you're a navigator, if you're, a, if you're a, a captain on a boat, whether you're out at sea in the salt water or if you're right in an internal waterway of France, you got the same kind of charts. And these charts were really handy for us because if we wanted to go for a walk, we'd take a photograph of that and we'd know just where to meet the boat at the next lock or at the next bridge or, or whatever. And uh, it was very easy because the boat would go about as fast as we could walk and we were free to lollygag on the land or relax on the deck. I was fascinated by how anybody could just 
tie up at these different places. You'd pay a little bit to more. But for our boat, um, I believe, uh, you know, the, the, the mate would jump off and hammer a stake into the ground. And then the boat would tie up to the stake and uh, we would put the gangplank out and we would come off and on with our bicycles or whatever. And this would be our home for the rest of the day and the evening. The next morning, we'd have a beautiful breakfast waiting for us. Every morning, a beautiful breakfast like that. It was, a, it was actually a big challenge for the chef to make sure we had fresh croissants every morning. If he had to get up early and get on the bicycle, he'd go to the nearest town and you just cannot serve breakfast without today's croissants. And it was really a delightful thing. Here's a little clip that just kind of shows what these ports where the people would tie up for the night were like. Hey, I'm Rick Steves. I'm on my bike on the Brigany Canal here. And this is a typical little port. People are just having a lovely time. Bonjour. And uh, there's a little station. You got your shower and your toilet and your electricity. And uh, a lot of these are rental boats that people just get. And they, you can tell the rental boats because they leave their fenders down the whole time. And there's always in France a great restaurant when people stop in a little tiny village and tie up. But this is the Canal du Centre in Burgundy. And we've been out on our bikes, taking a little trip up and down this industrial age canal, which was dug and maintained throughout the industrial age because it's the best way to get your, you know, your, your grain and your production to the market. But today, of course, there's not much of that, but there are beautiful boats like our boat. This is the Papillon. And uh, this is a whole kind of beautiful, beautiful new way to enjoy the great out of doors in Burgundy. Papillon and happy travelers and a beautiful, beautiful way to spend an afternoon in Burgundy. Happy travels from the Papillon. Hey, when I said a beautiful new way, I didn't mean a new way for everybody, a new way for me. I just am enthralled by how every year it seems I turn over a new kind of way to enjoy Europe whether it's long distance hikes or whether it's a lazy barge trip down a canal in the middle of France. As I mentioned, we could have a little huddle with the uh, captain and he'd, he'd we'd, we'd tell him we'd feel like to walk for an hour or two. And he'd say, well, why don't you meet us at the bridge or in a couple of locks? And, and we would walk along the, the canal and we could walk about as fast as the boat went. Just beautiful. Um, Bob and Ginny are avid bikers. They would do a lot of biking from the boat. And, um, uh, you know, this was so decadent, so much eating, so much drinking. Uh, we tried to get exercise. I tried to do my stretching. Stretching, by the way, um, I didn't take a photograph of the hike, but if you want to feel good, you need to stretch. Stretching is the best time you can invest, especially if you're exercising beyond your norm and you're traveling uh, around wherever. Um, I, I, I do my best to stretch and it it really makes things go better. Uh, every stop we could have a, we could find a place to play petanque. Of course, the boat would have its petanque. The boat comes equipped with everything you need. And, and we taught our friends how to play this wonderful game of petanque. And the boat had its own minibus. And, uh, we would, the captain would, would, uh, invite us into the minibus and we would take a side trip to uh, whatever he had in mind. There's a great chateau. It's called Chateau Cameron. And, um, it's been in the same family for 26 generations. And this is a chateau that, you know, the Papillon crew always takes their passengers to. And um, I didn't even know about this chateau. And it's a beautiful experience. The grounds and the interior, amazingly well-preserved interior, creaky floors, creaky doors, and so on. Nearby is a place called Brancion. And this is in our guidebook. It's the place we like to take our tours. And I just love Brancion for the for the, the, the feudal town, the castle that I'm standing on right now to take this photograph, the old Romanesque church, and uh, a chance to, to really learn about feudalism and Romanesque. Check this out here to learn about this amazing gem of a Romanesque church. Hey, I'm Rick Steves, and I'm in uh, Burgundy in a little hilltop village called Brancion. And what I love about this place is this amazing, delicate, delightful, Romanesque chapel. And we hear a lot about Gothic, 
Then we hear about Romanesque. Romanesque was the form before Gothic. And Romanesque is characterized, I mean, this is just textbook Romanesque. Stubby, thick walls, small windows, dark interior. This would have been, I don't know, the 10 or 1100s. And then in the 12 and 1300s, we get Gothic. But here we are on a hilltop with a castle, a small village, and the church. And the feudal lord would have looked over his domain here and he would control this whole corner of Burgundy. And when it was time to go to church, this was his Romanesque chapel. Romanesque was dark. And when you sit in a Romanesque church, you feel it's dark. And what Gothic was able to do was change out the round arches and have pointed arches. And with a pointed arch, you'd have bigger windows. And with bigger windows, you'd fill the church with glorious light. But I kind of like the Romanesque. And 800 years ago, so did this guy. Romanesque, Brancian. Also, you know, if you got any particular personal interest, uh, you got a minibus, you got the captain that's uh, working to help you have a good vacation, he'll take you there. We all are big fans of Teze. It's uh, sort of a um, uh, interdenominational, youthful monastery gathering place in, uh, in the heartland of monastic Europe around Cluny. Teze, T-A-I-Z-E. A lot of people have uh, Teze music at their churches, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful community. We dropped in there, and we just dropped in unannounced, and we got a tour and a great look at a phenomenon in Europe, really. And then we went to some amazing vineyards. Uh, we went to a place called Chateau de Chamaray, Chateau de Chamaray, and they've just got their very, very beautiful vines, and a proud family that for generations has run this place. Our captain knows them well. I mean, they're so well connected with these tours. We went into the, 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 the man of the manners, um, you know, um, special den filled with uh, historic bottles of wine. And then we got to sample the fruit of the vine. And it was a beautiful experience. And when we sample some wine on a cruise like this, you can bet that that evening, the captain will have bought a few bottles and we'll be sure to drink them on the deck of our boat every night under the stars. We just had beautiful evenings, more cheese, more wine, more cheese, more wine. Oh, baby. Well, we got uh, into that groove on the canals and um, we got to uh, just, the boat was our hotel. It was our home, the beautiful living room, wonderful staterooms, just beautifully designed, amazing boat, great bathrooms. It was all just lovely done. And uh, we got to be good friends with our with our crew and a nice last pastis as we cruise across the countryside of Burgundy. And then we are on our way to Switzerland. So that's the first half of our trip. And from France, we got on a train for four hours and we went to Lauterbrunnen, Interlaken and then Lauterbrunnen. And uh, in last year, I went, as, as I mentioned, I went around Mont Blanc and uh, Shelley and I hired a company that lined up our hotels, which came with dinner and provided a Sherpa service that took our bags from one hotel to the next. And every day for a week, we would uh, put our bag in the lobby. We would hike uh, the whole morning to get to a ridge, We'd usually go from 5,000 feet at the hotel to 8,000 feet to the top of the ridge, have our picnic lunch and hike down into the next valley where our bag would have been taxied ahead and meet us at the next hotel. We'd have a great dinner, a wonderful evening. And the next morning, we'd do the same thing again. Up a ridge, picnic, down to the next hotel, see our bags, up a ridge, down. Up, and it was a, a one week, 60 miles, uh, 10, uh, six, 60, 10, uh, six, 10 mile hikes. And it really worked well uh, for this trip. We didn't have the Sherpa service. We didn't have the tour company. We just did it on our own. And we booked a hotel in Gimmelwald or a bed and breakfast to stay in for the beginning and the end. And then we put together three mountain hotels in the middle, middle where we hiked from hotel to hotel over 72 hours. That's what we're going to do now 
and it was a delightful experience. Uh, the weather was good. Uh, the hiking was just at our right level, and we just had a glorious time. Uh, this is uh, the map of the valley around Gimmelwald, which I, I've loved for decades. And I just like this map because when I look at it, every little valley, every river, every waterfall, every farm, every lift, every peak, it has a memory. You just know it. And now when I look at that, it's just filled with the joy I've had enjoying the Alps in a firsthand intimate kind of way. That's what we embarked on for a whole week. No more gourmet food. It was just grocery store picnic lunches. And it was great. I'm very thankful in Switzerland for the Migros and the co-op grocery stores. For $20, we would just get whatever we wanted for lunch. And it was a beautiful lunch each day. Uh, we started out in Lauterbrunnen. Uh, we found that um, we really like to take photographs uh, behind the wall of falling water that you get when you go behind a waterfall. This is Staubach Falls. So you can hike up to Staubach Falls and be behind it. And it's just a beautiful sort of moment as you're in Lauterbrunnen Valley. On our first day, we rented bikes just to kind of ease into the hike. And uh, we biked up to the top of the valley from Lauterbrunnen to Steckelberg, and then all the way down the valley to Interlaken. And not wanting to bike uphill all the way back to Lauterbrunnen, we paid half price to get the bikes onto the train and just took the trains back to Lauterbrunnen. It was a beautiful day. And that was a, a way to start our Alpine experience to know the valley floor. We stayed at Hotel Oberland, which is run by Stephen McPhillamy. And we've had him on Monday Night Travel. My, Stephen is one of our guides at Rick Steves Europe. He's a great Irish guide. And he's got a hotel in Dingle. And he's got a hotel that he runs here in Lauterbrunnen Valley. And he's just an impressive hotelier. And one of our tour groups happened to be there. This is one of our My Way Alps tours. And it's the tour that has 12 days just for the best of the Alps from Italy through Austria, through Switzerland and finishing at Chamonix in France. And I had so much fun sharing a few moments with each of these people from one of our Rick Steves Alpine tours. And they were having a great time. And then we headed up to Gimmelwald. And I want to, I really learned a lesson from my friend, Ollie, who just said, you really need to take this opportunity and hike to the end of the valley, just an hour away. And here's a little video clip that explains the joy of getting away from the village, getting away from the hotel, getting away from the people and surrounding yourself with nature. It just takes an hour and you got to take the initiative and make it happen. Hey, I'm Rick Steves. I've just hiked an hour, good solid hike, an hour out of my little village. And I came to a place called Kilspaum. It's the end of the trail and it's a meadow. In fact, there's a, a cave up there where the uh, shepherd used to hang out, they say. And here we have a, just a feeling of the power of nature as we make sure to get away from the villages, away from the crowds, Who knows? Who knows what's just up the trail? But this is one hour from Gimmelwald and one hour from any of the other travelers. Enjoying nature, high in the Swiss Alps. Happy travels. I gotta say, that is so beautiful. And the lesson there, as I mentioned, is very clear. You need to take the initiative and take that walk. I'm, my, I'm not a good example of this. I, I have to remind myself because every time I do it, I earn a lifelong memory, whether it's in the Cotswold villages, you know, whether it's on the Loire Valley, whether it's up in the Swiss Alps, uh, whether it's on the beaches, uh, the, the Cinque Terre. An hour is a good solid walk. It gets you away from all the tourism. It puts you in the middle of nature, in the middle of that culture. Be sure you do that. That was a hike that Ollie recommended I take, and it was just a very gentle uphill the valley for one hour, spend an hour at the end of the thing, just enjoying it, and then hike back in time for dinner. What's not to like about that? Hey, this is Monday Night Travel. I want to thank you for joining us. I want to remind you, we, we're just kicking off our third season now. Uh, next week, Steve Smith is going to take us to Alsace. The week after that, our friend Ben Green, right on our own Monday Night Travel staff, is going to share his experience in Russia 
and in Helsinki. He was there when the war broke out, and then he had to leave the country and go to Helsinki. Ben's got some great lessons, some great stories to share two weeks from tonight, right here on Monday Night Travel. Three weeks from tonight, on the first Monday in October, I'll be back talking about my new art series. In a couple of weeks, we're debuting our six our mini series, European Art. It's Rick Steves, Art of Europe. And it's been the most exciting creative challenge in my career to put this together. It's been a two year project, and I'm so excited to share it with you. I want to give you a behind the scenes look at how we produced the art series and some of my highlights of this six hour series three weeks from tonight, right here on Monday Night Travel. I want to thank our staff. We couldn't do it without our staff, our wonderful staff. Gabe, he's our moderator tonight. Um, we've got Ben, who's back from Russia, and he is answering questions right now. Julianne and Lisa. I think Lisa just flew to Europe a couple of days ago, and she's leading one of our tours. But we've got this wonderful, wonderful staff of four great travelers that are our Monday night travel team, and uh, they do a great job. I want to remind you that uh, every uh, Monday night travel, we put in the chat section links to anything of interest in that evening's show. And today... We've got the whole um, lineup of everything I'm talking about and the websites and so on of the hotels and, and everything in the link in the chat section there. So check that out to get all the latest. I also, um, I had a guy from a, a publication called Insider interview me about my favorite little things that I take to Europe, the 25 uh, unique things that I take to Europe. And it was a it was a curious thing for me to do this interview, and it turned out really interesting. And we've got a link to that interview, that article right now in the chat section. And then in the Q&A section, that's where you ask your questions. And Ben is organizing the questions, and he's going to shuttle them over to Gabe. And then we're going to answer your questions uh, as soon as I'm done with this Swiss Alps section. So thanks again for joining us. I want to remind you that we are partying together. I hope you've got your favorite travel partner with you and a nice glass of wine or whatever you like to drink. People are usually curious about what I happen to be drinking. I want to remind you again, I'm drinking Beaujolais. Beaujolais is a light, fruity wine from Burgundy. It's not a uh, classic Burgundy wine, but it's from a region of Burgundy. And it is with a Gamay grape instead of a Pinot Noir grape, which is the rest of the Burgundy wine that's more famous. But this um, Beaujolais is a fun, light wine. And... Uh, it's one of the most highly produced wines in France, and you'll certainly find that in your travels, and it is worth looking up. Also, I've got my nibble board here. We're in Switzerland, so I'm enjoying a little bit of Emmental cheese. Mm, Emmental is Swiss cheese. I mean, it's the cheese with all the holes in it. Um, that used to be the sign of problems, but now they kind of make a big deal about it. They like the holes in it. It's um, from Emmen Valley. Emmental, tall is the German word for valley. You mix the Emmental cheese with Gruyere if you're going to do that fondue and dunk the, your bread into the molten cheese. Mm, it's cow cheese, aged for about four months, and it seems to go well with my Gamay grapes, my wine. Of course, I think anything goes well with wine. Mm. We've also got my Mousse Canard de what is it? Foie du Canard. Foie means the liver. And canard is duck, and it is mixed with eggs, with spices, and then infused with port wine. And I've got a little Dijon mustard, because we all like the word Dijon, and that happens to be just a short drive from where we are in our, on our cruise ship there. Mm. And I'm just wishing that you were right here so I could tell you more stories. But we're doing our best right now. We're virtually together. We're celebrating travel. And now we're going to carry on. So... We are hiking in the Alps, and it's all about this vista right here, the Eiger, Munch, and Jungfrau. Those are the big, famous mountains. On the left is the north face of the Eiger, famous for rock climbers. In the middle is the Munch, and on the right is the Jungfrau. In the saddle between the Munch and the Jungfrau is a mountain station right on the ridge. Can't hardly see it there, but a train goes tunneling through the rocks and it comes open at the very top of that ridge, believe it or not, 11,300 feet. 120 years ago, they did this tunnel. And it is still, I think you could call it the ultimate alpine trip. And um, the whole story is you got the Eiger, Monk, and Jungfrau. The Eiger, that's the, um, the ogre. The monk is the monk. And the Jungfrau is the young maiden, uh, the virgin. 
and the uh, the ogre wants to get the maiden, but the monk protects the maiden, the eiger, monk, and jungfrau. We went up to the Schiltorn, 10,000 feet for breakfast. The Schiltorn was open the same year they did the James Bond movie on Her Majesty's Secret Service. And before they opened it to the public, they used it as a prop in the movie. And today they have lots of fun making the movie theme entertaining for people who come up and visit. Uh, all of the lifts in, in the Alps are quite expensive. And they're working hard to give you these little value added experiences so you feel good about spending $40 to go to the top of the mountain or whatever. They have these thrill walks. And uh, here's a little clip that shows you the thrill walk at the halfway station on the way to the Schiltorn called Berg. Walk with me on the thrill walk, walk at Berg. Hey, I'm Rick Steves, enjoying one of these many amazing Swiss Alps lifts. We're at the medium station here and they've given us a little bit of excitement to pass the time while we wait for the next ride. Look at this. Here is the chance to gain confidence in Swiss engineering. Are you having a good time? Yeah, we do. Have. Wow, I'm walking on glass. I could plummet to my demise, but no, we're surviving the Swiss Alps. God, it's beautiful. It just occurred to me, by the way, don't overreact to your weather app. You know, a week before we got to our Alps, it, we looked at our app, you know, on, on your iPhone, and it just says, rainy, 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 five days of rain. It looked like it was going to be terrible. Same thing happened last year when we did the Mount Blanc trip. You cannot sum up a day's weather in one icon. That's the thing. Sure, there might be a thunderstorm in the afternoon. Weather changes, it blows in and out. We had glorious weather a year ago on the Mont Blanc trip and we had glorious weather on this trip and we were stressed out each time because the app said it was gonna be miserable weather. Uh, you need a more sophisticated, a more detailed weather report or you just gotta realize the weather's gonna change, you're gonna be there regardless, bring the right, right gear for the weather if it turns bad on you and then make it happen. We had glorious weather. Uh, the whole week that we were hiking in the Alps. And I'm just so thankful for that. I want to remind you, Switzerland knows how to build solid and they're investing in their infrastructure. And it's so interesting just to check it out in your travels. This is a new lift in the town of Murin. Uh, they've got these beautiful lifts, whether it's cable cars or funiculars or whatever. And at the top of each lift, you've got entertainment for the hikers, for the families. There's playgrounds, there's cafeterias, there's little cinemas, there's nature walks, you name it. One of my favorite hikes is what we took next. It's the North Face Trail, the North Face Hike. And it's not on the North Face. The North Face is way there in the distance on the left, that shaded side of the Eiger. That's the North Face. That's what the climbers climb. But on this hike, we have views of the North Face. And here you have the beautiful trail signs that tell you what's your altitude, where you are, and how long it take to walk to this and that place. We took our picnic lunch with us. That made a lot of sense. We found a nice spot to have our picnic. And then we did the North Face Trail. There was historic reader boards that talked about historic uh, ascents of the North Face and beautiful benches from where you could sit and ponder that adventure. Coming into these high mountain farms, just it's so much fun. This is the highest farm in the valley here. Im Schilt, it's called. And when I got there, I realized, hey, we were here filming a couple of years ago. About the last thing we filmed was our Best of the Alps special just before COVID. And uh, uh, we were at this uh, farm watching the cheese being made in the traditional way and then learning from a man who played the beautiful Alphorn. It was so fun to come back to this farm and to be able to show the people who worked there, the family that worked there, the clip from when we were there filming and sharing their culture, their farmhouse, their family's passion with America, thanks to public television. Uh, this is a good use for the Classroom Europe program. Went to ricksteves.com, went into Classroom Europe, typed in Alphorn, typed in G's Alps, and we had the clip just like that, and they had a kick watching it. By the way, 
All of our shows are available for free anytime, just to click away at ricksteves.com. And we produced that one hour special on the Alps just a couple of years ago, sharing our very important tips for Italy, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, and France. The best of the Alps in 60 minutes. It's a great hour if you haven't seen it. From that mountain farm, we hiked through a forest to a waterfall that I really like. It's called Spritz. And we got there and we hiked behind it. I love to hike behind waterfalls. Another cool opportunity for a photo. And then we hiked through a forest and we came to my favorite town, Gimmelwald, from the top. Normally we come from the bottom on the lift. But here we come out of the forest and we see the steep fields from where the farmers cut the hay. And then down at the bottom, that is our favorite village, Gimmelwald. Walking through Gimmelwald, it was like coming home. This is the main square in Gimmelwald. And I had a little visiting to do with my work. So I wanted to meet the new, uh, the woman who runs the youth hostel now. I've been coming here ever since I was a kid. Wonderful new management, lots of energy at the mountain hostel. I like to drop in and see David, my friend who runs the Gimmelwald, the, the rest the pension Gimmelwald, a little hotel, the only hotel in Gimmelwald and the only restaurant in Gimmelwald. And he actually makes a prize winning craft beer. And uh, he's just a cool guy. He's been running this hotel for 14 years. And it's a great thing for the village of Gimmelwald. And from here, Shelly and I are leaving for a three-day adventure. And from Gimmelwald, we look up the hill I've looked at for decades from Ollie's porch. And if you see the little plateau there on the very top, that's called the dancing table. And that's where we're hiking to now. We're heading off for that. It's a steep hike. We got up there, and on the way, we came to a mountain um, alp, a, a high meadow where the where the cows are and the goats are in the summertime before they put on the bells and dingle dangle all the way back down into the lower valley. And uh, it's called Bussen Alp, and Bussen Alp has uh, a, a bunch of cows, a few goats, a couple of horses, and a handful of chicken. And I wanted to meet the woman who runs the place. This is Elisa. And Elisa lives there alone with the animals, takes care of them throughout the whole summer, and then brings them down at the end of the season. This is your classic Alp situation, the high meadow where the goats and the cows munch on the grass and the Swiss milk the animals and make their cheese. We had a great time visiting with Elisa, and then we hiked on. Uh, there's a main trail, and one thing that we really were happy we did was hide our bags, stow our bags whenever we took a detour. You can see Shelly down at the bottom of the trail there. We just tucked our bags away here, and we did the side trip to visit uh, Elisa in her Alp, uh, and then came back and picked up our bags. Later on, we got to this fork in the road, and we hit our bags again so we could make the side trip up to Tanzelbodli. Tanzelbodli is literally dancing table. It says 20 minutes, but it was a lot more than that. And it was a tough hike, I'll tell you. We left our bags. Later on, we stowed our hiking sticks because it got to be a scramble where we're just hiking up. And I got, you can see right here, the dancing table in the shadow of this shark fin kind of peak. And I was just about to the top of this. And I started to get second thoughts. I started thinking, I don't know, is this dangerous? Or, or, are we going to regret this? If uh, either of us fell and twisted our ankle, all I know is, 1414 is the number you call to get a helicopter to lift you out of there. I mean, you just, there's no other way out. It's three hours walk from anything. And I was kind of hemming and hawing and wondering, should I get to the top? And there I am just a hundred yard, a hundred meters from the top of that little hike. And my phone rings. I couldn't believe it. My phone rang and it was Ollie. And he was looking at us from his balcony, from his back porch, I mean, with his telescope. And he sensed that I was about to chicken out. And he said, Rick, you got to do it. Don't stop. It's just another 50 meters. You can do it. It's okay. And I went up there. We hiked up to the very top and we danced on the dancing table. And it was a beautiful, beautiful moment. I'm so thankful for Ollie and his telescope to make sure I didn't lose my nerve at the very end. Here's a moment up on the dancing table, high above Lauterbrunnen and Gimmelwald. Hey, I'm Rick Steves, and uh, I'm just realizing a long-time dream. I'm standing on a place called the Dancing Table, Tansliboden, 
and it's high above my beloved Lauterbrunnen Valley in the little village of Gimmelwald, Murin, the Schiltorn, and we hiked from Gimmelwald today up to this place, and I tell you, it was about the ultimate for me. I mean, it was a, a stretch. But you come, you arrive here, there's just three or four of us on the top right now. And you arrive after this steep climb and you're rewarded with the dancing table. And uh, it's just, I've been coming here for 30 or 40 years and uh, there's so many delights that await when we come back and nowhere to go. But this is the Brunner Oberland on a beautiful day, looking down at Lauterbrunnen. We're sleeping in that village there, Gimmelwald. And uh, sometimes you have to earn the unforgettable memories. And this is certainly one of them. So today, we're hiking into this next valley. And we'll be sleeping in the Mountain Hotel as we put together a multi-day High Alps extravaganza. Oh man, oh baby, this is just gorgeous. Happy travels from the Swiss Alps. The dancing table. It's quite a moment, quite a moment. And we made sure to take full advantage of it. And we took a little, a little break and celebrated the where we were before hiking on. I do want to remind you, in the um, chat section, we do have this information about the names of all of these places. I'm not saying the plan that we took was perfect, but the hikes were great and it's totally doable and um, it was not that expensive. And uh, I'm just really thankful for it. So if you want the details, the recipe for what we did, it's right there. Uh, okay, so we hiked, and this is the trail for a couple more hours. And we got to this mountain hotel. It's interesting to think that there are these venerable old mountain hotels. They go back to the 1800s, and they're off the grid. It's two hours to hike to the nearest car, to the nearest paved road, to the nearest lift. You cannot get here without a two-hour hike, and it's a tough hike. The ambience, the, the, the camaraderie, uh, the how good a beer tastes. I mean, it's an amazing experience. And um, we had a beautiful evening up there. Uh, the rooms are just woody and sort of uh, rustic elegant. Uh, it's a great place just to put on your slippers and uh, just enjoy. Um, uh, the the food is, is hearty. There's no menu. You got to eat whatever's cooking. There's not much electricity. There's not much Wi-Fi. There's not much water. But Everybody is having a great, great experience uh, doing the Alps. Uh, late in the evening, uh, just about the end of dinner, the, the sun is warming up the mountains before it goes down. And we all went out and took a picture of that. And I had to take notes. I was on vacation. I was trying not to work. I didn't work at all on the, on the Burgundy Canal trip because that's not in the book. But this is in the book. And I was able to do things I've I've always wanted to cover better in the book. And it was for me as a travel writer and a guidebook researcher, it was a delight to be able to meet the families that ran these hotels and to be able to write the details into the book. And I actually got a lot done just on making our chapter, uh, this chapter in our Switzerland book, stronger and better than ever. The next morning, we hiked for three hours to get down back down to Lauterbrunnen Valley. And, and here you see way at the head of the valley, this is the upper Lauterbrunnen there. We hiked down that valley to get to here. And then we caught the bus uh, from Steckelberg all the way to Lauterbrunnen. And from Lauterbrunnen, we caught the train up to Wengen. And from Wengen, we took the gondola up to Manlikin. And this is where all the tourists go. This is easy. Wengen's a big resort. It's just a 15 minute ride to the top to Wengen. And uh, you've got your playground, you've got your cafeteria, you've got your restaurant. <laughs> and You've got a beautiful stroll, just a two-hour stroll from Menlikin along views of the Eiger, the north face of the Eiger, right there. It's right in your face. And you're heading for Kleinescheidig. Kleinescheidig. This is where two trains come together. This is the highest depot. And then from there, the train goes uphill. 
and it tunnels through those rocks all the way to the top of the ridge to 11,300 feet. That's the Jungfrau Yoke train. Um, I'm going to show you in a minute a station called the Eiger Glacier. It's way up here where the where the snow ends, where the ice ends. That's the new terminus for the new lift that goes directly down to the resorty town of Grindelwald. But we slept in this big 19th century old world elegant hotel on top of Kleine Scheidegg. This is where traditionally the mountaineers that are about to climb the Eiger, the north face of the Eiger, spend their last night before uh, embarking. And we had a beautiful, beautiful dinner there and a wonderful time after people went back down. For decades, I've been at Kleine Scheidegg when it's just a mob scene, when it's pandemonium, when everybody's trying to get on the train and everybody's there in the middle of the day. At night, the last lift down, the last mountain biker rolls away, and all of a sudden, it's just you and a handful of travelers that decided to spend the night up there. The stars are bright. Ah, the food is good. And you're where you want to be the next morning. The next morning, we got on the lift. And we tunneled up the mountain to get to that highest point you can get mechanically in this part of Switzerland, 11,300 feet above sea level, 11,300 feet. And it was a whiteout. It was our only bad day of weather of the whole trip. And we had mountain passes. So we, we just went, even though it wouldn't have been a good value to pay the regular price. And we just pretended we can see beautiful things from the top. But the neat thing about these lifts is there's lots to do at the top. They've actually got a chart that shows you where all the entertainment is. They're working so hard to make you feel good about spending all that money for the lift ticket. Back down at the station above Kleine Scheidegg, you've got the Eiger Glacier. It's a big new development. They've spent $400 million, 400 million, almost half a billion dollars building this lift. And this is the new lift that takes 25 people in each cable car from the touristy resort of Grindelwald, where I always say, don't go rather than Gimmelwald, where I like to hang out in the next valley. But this is mass tourism, and they've got $400 million to build a lift so that their mass groups can get to the top of the Jungfrau yoke quicker and back to their shops so everybody can be happy in the mass tourism trade. Uh, it's, you know, they're, it's very competitive, and they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars in Chamonix and in Zermatt and in Grindelwald. This is the terminus the station at the bottom of that cable car lane. And from there, we took a train down to the little village of Fildersville, and we got on a cogwheel train from there, and we went up to the top of Kleine Scheidegg. And that's where, no, I'm not Kleine Scheidegg, Schinnegeplatt. And we stayed in an old hotel on Schinnegeplatt, a family-run hotel, uh, kind of a nostalgic place, like all of these old off-the-grid hotels that are so high country. And, um, you know, this is the man who runs the hotel. He's a cool guy. And he had the traditional 19th century water basins and jugs and the the, the hot water bottle that would heat your bed. And uh, it was just kind of a fun, nostalgic hotel. But the cool thing about it is, and the reason we stayed up here is, we had a long hike the next day. And we took the lift up. We hiked at the high altitude for six or seven hours. And then we talked the lift down at the other end of that walk. And the last lift was going at five o'clock. And Shelly and I go slow. We pet the cows. We take the photographs. We have the picnic. We take the little side trips. We don't want to be in a hurry. And we wanted the time. So we got an early start from our hotel. And we just had a glorious day. Here's the red and white that marks the trail. Red and white means the more difficult trail. And I would say, for anybody my age, you need those sticks. You got to have the sticks. It empowers you when you're doing red and white painted trails. The red and white are the tougher trails, and you need your sticks. We got up to this beautiful viewpoint, just a 20-minute hike from our hotel. And let me just give you a little moment here. Hey, I'm Rick Steves, and I'm in a little peak here called Dauba. I know that because I can read the signpost. It says 2,076 meters. That's about 7,000 feet above sea level. We spent the night at Schindigaplatt, and now we're walking to first, six hours away. And here we have a wonderful pinnacle. I mean, I love these 360 degree views. Down here, down in Interlaken, they might think it's cloudy, but we're in the high country. Interlaken, between the two lakes, Brienz and Thun. And around us here, 
we can see the glorious Berner Oberland, the Bernese Oberland, French or German, the area south of Interlaken, famous for two valleys. There's Lauterbrunnen and there's Grindelwald. This little spot is called Dauba. And ahead of us, we got the Eiger Monken Jungfrau. So today we're going to walk about five hours, maybe six hours, along this ridge. And we'll get to a top of a ski lift called First. We'll ride that down to Grindelwald and catch the train back to our cute little village of Gimmelwald. Oh man, hiking in the Swiss Alps. Gee whiz. It's really, really a highlight of any vacation. Happy travels. Happy travels from the Bernice Oberland. Wow. Embarking on this hike, it was seven hours, no water between the beginning and the end. So we had to be sure our water was filled up and we kind of had to ration it. As I was explaining where everything was there, it's kind of, it's sort of a deja vu about being a tour guide. Because for 25 years, I was taking groups up into this valley and everybody is disoriented. And it's just kind of stressful. And you want to have a great time tomorrow, but you don't know what ends up. And uh, it's just flat out confusing but you got to just grapple with it. And, and, you know, as you're out and about, look at the map and put things together. And pretty soon you get accustomed to it and you know where you are. I know where we were here. We were on the most glorious ridge walk I have ever done. I did it a couple of times in my twenties. I haven't done it since. And now with Shelly, I had the chance to do it again. All of my teaching career, I've used this as an example of the magic that awaits you when you venture into the better corners of the Alps. And when I was a kid, I, I had this notion that you're walking on a ridge and, and this and that. And I, I've, I've used this little moment to describe it. And I, I was back here doing it again in person. And it was so cool. Let me just share with you the, the moment that I've remembered ever since I was a kid and I've shared in my lectures all these years. Hey, I'm Rick Steves and I'm happy and high in the Swiss Alps. And ever since I was a kid, I've been reminding people, you can put yourself on a ridge, like tight roping on a ridge, high above the valleys. On one side, you got lakes stretching all the way to Germany. On the other side, you got cut glass peaks, the Eiger, Monk, and Jungfrau, just glorious mountain scenery. And ahead of you, you hear the long legato tones of an Alphorn announcing that the helicopter stock mountain hut is open. It's just around the corner and the coffee schnapps is on. Happy travels. Mmm. And the coffee schnapps is on. Man, oh man, what a day. What a day. The weather was nipping at our heels the whole day, but it, it stayed good. And we kept walking and it was, it was enough to raise your poles into the air and just celebrate. I had a magic moment here, and I just want to give a little love to my boots, my bag, and my hiking poles, and the most classic little alpine farm you can imagine. Here you go. Hey, I'm Rick Steves. I'm enjoying a beautiful hike in the Alps. I just wanted to show you a classic alpine farm. Look at this meadow, all this luscious, luscious salad, and there's a bunch of happy cows and a beautiful farm and I'm just on a ridge here and uh, I gotta say this is my kind of hike I rode the lift up and I gained my altitude and then I'm traversing for five hours to another lift that'll take me down <clears throat> and uh, I just get to it's sort of a economic way to <laughs> enjoy the high country I got good boots, murals, everybody loves those. <laughs> I borrowed some poles, and I wouldn't do a demanding hike without poles. And I borrowed them from my bed and breakfast host. And then I loved my Osprey day bag. Um, but I'm no serious hiker. But I'm a serious enjoyer of hiking. And this is what the Swiss Alps is all about. Mm. Listen to the melody of the cowbells.
Ah. Lake Brienne's, Interlaken, Lake Thun, Schinnegeplatt, my beautiful little farm, the Eiger, Monk, and Jungfrau. It's Alpine Bliss. Happy travels. Oh, it is Alpine Bliss. My goodness. I was up there thinking, I said the economic way to do this, uh, to go take the lift up and the lift down, that was economic for your time and your energy spent, but it's not economic monetarily because it's expensive to take the lift up and it's expensive to take the lift down. So right there is probably $40, $50 maybe for the, for the lifts. And then you enjoy this ridge walk. Uh, a cheaper way to do it and a day that doesn't uh, it doesn't take a whole day to walk for seven hours. And this is the kind of thing I look for when I'm updating my guidebooks is to realize the very best of that whole seven hour hike was the first hour and a half along that ridge. And you could go up to Shindigaplat. And then there's a thing called the Panorama Veg, the Panorama Way that does what I've done so far and then loops back down below that farm back to your starting point. And that's a two hour or a three hour walk instead of the seven hour walk. And then you get a round trip fare to go up to Shindigaplat and back. In other words, anybody could take half a day and go up to Shindigaplat, do the two or three hour walk around, enjoying that ridge, and then take the, the round trip return down to Buildersville. And then you're back down on the valley floor and you're interlocking. That's the kind of practical issues that we deal with when we're um, updating the guidebooks and sorting through your options so you can travel and uh, know what your options are and, and have maximum travel thrills for every mile, minute, and dollar. Here's to that. Yeah. I hope you're enjoying our hike. We're almost done. I just wanted to have another sip of my Beaujolais. It's kind of fun to be so close to France and still on top of the Alps, mixing it up. Let's carry on here. This was an amazing day to be on this Alp. Ah, it was just so good. We hiked and we hiked. There was a little hut halfway, but nobody could go there without being a customer. So they had a toilet, they had water, but you couldn't use it. <laughs> but we just had our water and we had our picnic. And we didn't need that stinking little hut. We had the clouds nipping at our heels all day long, but we had blue skies. We had happy cows and we had a high altitude picnic lunch. Boy, just a simple ham and cheese sandwich. I'm going to have, that's that same exact Emmental cheese, by the way, Emmental. Swiss cheese. Can you imagine a picnic right there? That's good stuff. I love the, the grocery stores in Switzerland, the, the Migros and the co-op. For 20 bucks, you get two great lunches in the most expensive country around. We hiked on the ridge, we carried on, and then we finally got to First. First, it's a funny name, but that's the name of the lift, the top of the lift here, a station called First. And you have one of these thrill walks again. You can see the, the walk, and it takes you all the way out. And this is very, very popular with people who are not hikers, but they go up from Grindelwald, the touristy resort at the base of this lift. They just go up here. They have their Instagram mo moment, of course. Got to have that. They'll see crowds in certain spots getting their Instagram shot. And then they take the lift back down. We took the lift down, caught the train back, and went back to our home base, Ollie and Maria's B&B. &B. Had a beautiful last evening there. Maria is a violinist and I'm a piano player and we made music together like we've always wanted to do. It was really cool. And then I spent the rest of the visit the next morning enjoying their backyard like you'd enjoy the beach, just reclining on the lounge chair, enjoying the view, enjoying the breeze, enjoying memories of the great hikes we had. That evening, Shelly and I went to Zurich the capital city or the big city, not the capital, but the biggest city for our flight home. And we spent the night at an airport hotel, which is a weird thing, but we wanted to be right at the airport for our early departure. And talk about culture shock when you're at the airport after all of that off the grid, Alpine wonder. Man, oh man, Gabe, that was fun to share that. I just, I relived it. I relived it. And that's the fun thing about Monday night travels. We get together and we, we share these experiences every week. You get to host travelers that are just enthusiastic about what they've done, what they love, what they want other people to be able to appreciate. 
and I've just enjoyed that tonight. Do we have any questions? Um, yes, uh, Rick, building off of what you said, one of our viewers in the Q&A was saying that during our summer break, when we took a few weeks off, um, that they and their friends did their own Monday night travel, sharing their travel stories to get through oh, the week. Oh, that's, so. that's great. In fact, in the last week, I've been on the road. I was in um, Frederick, Maryland and Norfolk, Virginia, and talking to lots of people at these big uh, events. So many Monday night travel friends, and uh, it's just a big family of travelers. So it's very cool. Gabe, were we going to do a, like a flash poll or something to see what yes. people liked? I'd be curious. Yeah. You have? So um, you presented us with two vacations. You did you did both of them, barging in Burgundy and hiking in the Alps. But um, uh, we were curious of which people would choose to do if they just had one week in Europe to do a vacation. So um, Rick, if you want to give us a word from our sponsor, I'm launching this poll right here. Uh, how would you rather spend, spend your next European vacation? Um, and while you give us our word from our sponsor, <laughs> people can vote and we'll see. Okay. And when we're looking at this, by the way, Gabe, uh, we got your choice. You can click barging in Burgundy or hiking in the Swiss Alps, but let's pretend they both cost the same, okay? Mm, so yeah. you, you can't just say, I don't want to spend all that money or I can't afford the barging trip. Let's just say you can have it as a gift. <laughs> Which would you take? <laughs> a week barging in Burgundy or a week hiking in the Alps? This would be interesting. And while you do that, I want to give you a word from our sponsor. Our sponsor is a little company in Seattle called Rick Steves Europe. It's a hundred happy travelers, travelers like you and me, Gabe, but plus 98 others. And we are so thankful that we're back on the road. We've taken, uh, well, right now we have like 70 buses in Europe, 40 different itineraries. I saw one of them there and when I was in Lauterbrunnen. And uh, we're just so thankful that we can be back in Europe, that we're handling. I mean, there's still a little bit of COVID concerns, but um, every week we have an on-the-road report from, we've got a thousand people in Europe right now on our tours. And uh, we have about a 1.5 or a 2% COVID rate on our tours. So it's kind of COVID roulette. One in 50 are going to get COVID. Nobody's going to the hospital. Nobody's needed any medical care. It's just they get COVID and they have to leave the tour and they have to isolate until they get uh, testing positive again. And um, it's no longer a crisis. It's kind of a policy. And we're really thankful for the progress we've made on that. So if you're curious about our tour program, um, it's so exciting to get our guides back going, our bus drivers back going, and our tour members over there. We took 10 or 12,000 people to Europe this spring, had a great time, and we're going to take 10 or 12,000 people again this fall. We're in the thick of it right now. We've got just a smattering of seats still available this year. If you're curious about any tours, we're just putting them on sale to fill up those buses if we can. But the big news is we have opened the floodgates for 2023 tours. We've got 40 itineraries we are gonna have a blast next year. I'm gonna be going to Europe in late November to do a couple of guide mentoring tours. We're hiring some new guides and they're all great guides. That's why we're hiring them. They're professionals. They got a lot of experiences, but I want them to travel with me so I can let them know what distinguishes a Rick Steves tour. That's what we want. And they're gonna be uh, on board before we know it and we'll be able to take more people to Europe. So that's good news if you're curious about our tour program. Another word from our sponsor, our guidebooks. When COVID hit, we had 15 out of the top 20 guidebooks in the United States for Europe. And we still dominate the market that way because we lovingly update our guidebooks and it was all hands on deck this spring. I spent two months updating the books along with all of our research researchers and co-authors. The new post-COVID books are finally coming back from the printer. I understand London, Paris, Rome, and Spain are in the bookstores right now, and the rest of them are on their way. So that's good news. If you're going on your own, you need a guidebook. If you're going with a group, we can help you out. Our long-awaited TV show, Rick Steves, Art of Europe, two years in the making, is hitting the United States all across the country in October. Find out when your city is running it. It's a six hour mini series and it is the most exciting project I've ever done in TV production. I'm so, so thrilled to be able to share my love of Europe in a six hour series. And I've been talking about bags and I just realized that today we have a sale on, on our website. And this is the bag that I live out of for three months a year in normal times. I've spent a third of my adult life living out of this carry on the airplane size bag, nine by 22 by 14 inches. This is what I was traveling with on my last tour. 
And I won't give you the whole spiel on that bag, but I just love it. If I could get a better bag for 500 bucks, I'd buy it today. But this bag is, I've designed it. It fits my needs perfectly. It normally costs $100 and it's on sale right now for 20% off, $80 for the bag of your dreams. You can check that out along with everything else at ricksteves.com. Gabe, I bet that flash poll is in. We've got the tally. I'm yes. really curious. Well, Rick, you mentioned a sale, and I think that you sold both of these trips well because we had over 1,450 votes, and it came down to a difference of 11. Here we go. Drum roll. Ah. in Burgundy got it by 11 votes. Barging, there's a lot of people that like to eat and drink surrounded by French, beautiful scenery. Wow. And it Isn't was when you said that cost was not a concern that it kind of edged into the lead. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's true. That would it'd be interesting to know who would, who would pay for the barging in Burgundy. I'm sure a lot of people would pay if they've got the, the opportunity. Hey, that's great. Thanks, everybody, for playing that. And that was interesting, Gabe. I was really curious which would yeah. which would work. Very evenly matched. Hey, we got um, uh, a few minutes for some questions and I'm yes. going to have a little more of this uh, Beaujolais. What's the question? Perfect. Um, so our first question comes from Teresa. We get this question a lot because people get really excited about wanting to go to the places we cover. Um, you went to two very different places. What would you say is, would you say is a good time of year to go to Burgundy and what's a good time of year to go to the Swiss Alps? First of all, if you're hiking in the Alps, you don't want to go in the spring because the high altitude trails are more likely to be covered in snow in the spring. In the fall, you know, there's a bell-shaped curve for the weather, but the same uh, altitude, uh, latitude on the bell-shaped curve is not the same when you consider snow. In the spring, you've got snow problems, but during the fall, you do not have snow problems. So I like the fall for hiking. I like to avoid the heat and the crowds of summer when I can. I'll tell you, when we were on the barge in Burgundy, had we been on that barge a week earlier, we would have been uncomfortably hot. There was a heat wave in France and it would not, it would have been a real, uh, a real shame because we had been counting on such a beautiful experience, but we hit it just right. And we had beautiful weather and it was just lovely. Uh, and uh, last year when Shelly and I did our trip uh, in the, around Mount Blanc, we did it in the same week we did the hike this year in the Berner Oberland, the first week in September. And it was just wrapping things up in uh, Mount Blanc. Um, some of the things were closing down and so on. And I'm glad we did it at the very end of the season. It was comfortable. It wasn't too hot and it just felt good. And I really liked the way we did it in Switzerland on this last trip. So I would say for both of these trips, um, early September is, is ideal, you know. Additionally, Rick, Mark was wondering, um, did you and Shelly both manage to just pack a, a convertible carry-on because, I mean, you had two very different experiences. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All these excuses. <laughs> two weeks, two months, rich, poor, north, south, man, woman, you know, old, young. It doesn't matter. You pack light. This is what I have to tell Shelly, okay? <laughs> you pack light. And um, we worked on it and uh, we did a good job. And it is a little complicated, admittedly, because you're on a cruise ship and you want to have some, you know, nice things to wear and you're hiking in the Alps and you need your boots. So, uh, you know, we had to compromise in both areas, but um, the toughest thing for me was I had to bring this Osprey bag uh, for my day bag up in the Alps because you couldn't use my beloved uh, you know, Chivy Today bag that that I carry around in all my TV shows and we sell like hotcakes on our website. That's for cities. It's not a scientifically designed thing that distributes the weight like this does. It just hangs on your back and that's fine for the cities. You wouldn't want this in a museum in Madrid. You know, this is what you want when you leave Ollie's place for three days going from hut to hut. Um, but we needed this. So this is what I carried onto the airplane. That was my day bag on the airplane. And this is the main bag, you see. So that was the main challenge. To be honest, I put the Chivy Today bag in here because when we were on the barge, I didn't want to carry the Osprey bag. I wanted to use the Chivy Today bag. Um, but when you think about it, you don't need a lot more than just your basic clothing. Shoes are a big deal if you got as big a feet as me. Um, you know, so I'm really strict about shoes. And um, we borrowed the hiking poles. Um, 
because you can't take your hiking poles on the plane without checking them because they are weapons. Hmm. Um, Rick, Bill was wondering um, if if one was just going to be doing more of a, you know, renting a car and driving around Burgundy, um, what town would you recommend as a good home base? Bone, B E. A-U-N-E or something like that, mm -hmm. Bone. I love Bone. We went there. I just wanted to go there. We went there on our minibus from the from the barge. And uh, we go there with all of our tours for years. When I've led our Best of Europe tour, it goes from Italy to Switzerland to Paris. You know, going from Switzerland, to, we have to have one stop in France that's not Paris. That's really required. And my choice is Bone of all of France. It's a great place to go. So in Burgundy, Bone, bone is great. Um, Lyon is nearby and Lyon is rivals Paris in so many ways. So the two urban slices of Eastern France that I know that I really like are Lyon, L-Y-O-N, and Bonn. Hmm. Um, hearing you spell out Bonn makes me think, Rick, that one of these Monday night travels, we should do a spelling bee. <laughs> I'm not playing. Do that when I'm not there. I cannot spell all these words. <laughs> um, also, uh, shifting over to the Alps, but still talking small towns, um, Carol said that she has a common argument with her sister about what the best small town um, in the, the mountains above Lauterbrunnen is. Um, one of them prefers Wangen and one of them pre prefers Murin. What's your favorite? I don't want to make enemies in Wangen, so I just want to talk directly to, what's her name, Carol? Carol. <laughs> Carol. Okay, Carol, just you and me. Um, Wengen is a resort. Wengen has uh, not many people living there all year long. It's for wealthy people that have a little escape in the mountains. Um, lots of hotels. Uh, Murin has more of a culture. It's got a school. It's got, you know, it's, it's, it's real people. I think Murin is a more real town than Wengen. They're both gorgeous. If you want splashy resort in the mountain opera ski stuff you could make a case for Wangen. uh but if you want um something that has more historic roots i would go for murin so it's a personal choice and my choice would be murin uh, the nice thing about murin is it's on the less touristed side of the mountain and it's just a half hour walk from gimmelwald where my heart resides when it's not mm. elsewhere yeah, your favorite wouldn't be either of those. It'd be Gimmelwald, right? It'd be, right. It'd be, it'd be Gimmelwald, yeah. Yeah. Um, a few quick questions just about the hiking in the area. Um, another Carol is wondering how busy were the hiking trails? Did the you trails, see a lot of other people? No, the trails were not busy at all. The and, and when you met somebody, it was delightful. You'd say, Grüß Gott, Grüß Guten Tag, Bonjour, Hi. I mean, it's just fun. There's just this little back and forth and everybody's in a great mood. Everybody's very gentle. Oh, the world could be that way. <laughs> if the world could be like just meeting somebody who speaks a different language in the Alps, that'd be a delight. Um, Cecilia was also wondering, what do you know approximately what the highest elevation you hiked to was? You know, her, her concern is probably, are you going to feel the altitude and is that a problem? Um, generally, we would sleep at 5,000 feet and hike up to 8,000 feet. That was the case in Mount Blanc and that was the case in the Berner Oberland around Interlaken where we were just now. And um, I don't feel the altitude between 5,000 and 8,000 feet at all. Um, I feel it a lot at 10,000 or 12,000 feet. And you can ride a lift up to 10 or 12,000 feet in Europe. And then you're winded when you climb the, uh, when you climb the stairs, I would not want to climb at that level. I mean, cause I'm not a rugged outdoorsy type uh, mountaineer, but you know, if you hike, if you have a good solid hike from a 5,000 foot starting point up to 8,000 feet where you have your picnic, I'm not speaking for everybody because some people have altitude problems at much lower levels than I do. But I know a lot of people read this stuff and they hear these stories and they want to put on patches and take medicine and do all sorts of uh, extreme measures. I've never even noticed it. It's not an issue. I like the, I like the altitude. <laughs> um, Rick, uh, Simon was also wondering, do you see people that are doing kind of like wilderness tent camping or people that do 
other activities like mountain biking on those trails, or is it pretty much just day hikers? You don't see people camping wild. I mean, people do it. We met some people with a backpack going up to the dancing table that when we were coming down, they were going up to spend the night because they wanted to see the the sunrise, you know, that's kind of thing. Um, But that's sort of the uh, exception to the rule. Um, Mountain biking is a big deal. And you see that a fair amount when you're on a mountain bike trail, but we were not. Um, And otherwise there's campgrounds, but they're in the valley floor. So you don't, you do not see a lot of that. You see people hiking and you have mountain huts, either huts or hotels. I wanted to stay in nice hotels. I didn't want to stay in a hut. There are huts up there and they have things called matrats and lagers, a matrats and lager. I love to just say that matrats and lager is a mattress uh, loft. It's a loft that's filled with mattresses with an army blanket and a pillow. And, uh, you know, you can bring your own sheets if you want to, or you can rent the sheets, or you can just crawl into what a German told me is the germs of centuries. You're <laughs> climbing into the germs of centuries. But that's a not Ratzenlager. That's really cheap, 20 bucks per person or something. Rick, we have time for one more question. It comes from Aaron. Um, I know that you've often said that the best day of each trip is when you get to come home to to Edmonds, Washington. Uh, But Aaron was wondering, over the years, the more you travel, has it gotten easier or more difficult to leave after a trip to Europe? To leave from Europe to go home? Yeah, just the the feeling of leaving that experience does it get easier does it get more difficult i'm very um privileged to be able to travel as part of my work you know when i i mean when i travel i'm producing so i'm actually the more i travel the more money i make because i'm just working all the time and that's my business so i have a excuse to go back to europe a lot and um i know psychologically it's not tough to go home because i know i'll be going again What right now kind of weighs on me is, will I ever go back to these places that I'm going to again? That's a psychological thought that is seeped into me just as I've been deeper into my 60s. Europe is a big place. It takes 20, 30 years to go to all the places I love. Will I ever go back to Belfast? Will I ever go back to Toledo? Will I ever go back to to Monambasia and the Peloponnesian Peninsula? Will I ever go back to Cappadocia in Turkey? Will I ever go back to Krakow in Poland? I sure hope so, but you can't know what the future is. But going home, there's no question that I will go back to Europe. And when I go home, I'm ready to go home. And when I get home, I'm ready to take off again. (laughs) And in the meantime, we got Monday night travel, don't we? And Monday Night Travel is how we all get together, whether we're on a plane or able to go to Europe or whatever's going on in our lives. We can celebrate travel right here. I want to remind you, next Monday, Steve Smith, our good buddy who knows more about France than anybody in this country, I would say, he's going to take us to Alsace. Alsace is that wonderful part of France that rubs up against Germany, where you meet people named Jacques Schmidt. And where sauerkraut comes with fine sauces. I mean, it's this quirky mix of German and French culture that just is so fun. Steve's going to take us to Alsace two weeks from tonight. Our own Ben Green from our Monday Night Travel crew is going to share with us the year he had in Russia. And then he had to leave Russia. He just got out after the war started before they shut it down and he would have been trapped there. And he spent the rest of his educational year in Helsinki in Finland. Ben's got stories and lessons to share two weeks from tonight, right here on Monday Night Travel. And then three weeks from tonight, I'm coming back. And I'm going to be celebrating our new art special, our six-hour mini-series that's airing all over the country. Check it out in your city. It's booked for October. Find out when it's going to be. Put it on your calendar. It's just the most exciting thing we have ever produced. Six hours of European art from the beginning, from the pyramids to Picasso, from the Parthenon until today. I'm going to be talking about that on October 3rd. Hey, thank you all very much for joining us. We want to thank our crew at Monday Night Travel and wish you happy travels. Thanks. Good night, Ben. Good night, Rick. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Ben. Good night, Rick. 
Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us.